One, two, three. Yeah. yeah. Back. Back at it. Back at it. Like a good habit. Let's go. Let's go, guys. Oh, we we got, got um Larry Elder explains how he became a conservative. That's Isn't awesome. That I always nice. like to know why. Yeah. And usually, if you notice anybody who switched from a from a leftist view to a conservative, they um it was it was on free will and accord and education. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Education, knowledge changes things, especially applied knowledge. So, yeah, he didn't want to just learn something and then act like, and then try to unlearn it. Let's go. Formed your political viewpoint, because obviously taking the position as a black person in America that racism is not the key factor right. in American life or even a key factor in right. American life. It's a pretty controversial position. Where did you get that from? Because it's a pretty from, rare position. It, I got it from my dad. My father... My father and I didn't get along. Um, my father and I had a huge fight when I was 15 years old, and we didn't speak for 10 years. Whoa. When I say didn't speak, Ben, I mean did not speak. Not like, hi, Dad, uh, and that's it. I didn't say a word to him. And I graduated from high school, and I was able to then go to college on the East Coast and law school in the Midwest. So basically, I had voted my dad for almost 10 years. Now, now my mom and my dad were mar still married in the house. So when I would come home uh, for vacation, for summers, I would just make sure I'm not around when he's not around. And wow. that was pretty easy because my dad worked long hours. He had a cafe. So now I'm uh, fast forward, it's tw I'm 25 years old. I've now graduated from law school. I have this big uh, uh, job with a big law firm making a boatload of money. I'm 25 years old and I should be living large. But Ben, I can't sleep. And I know it has something to do with my dad. Uh, not that I ever thought we'd be buddies, but I called my secretary and I said, cancel all my appointments. I'm flying to LA and I'll be back in a couple of days. I didn't tell my parents I was coming because I didn't, didn't want my father to prepare for this summit. So I get to the uh, airport, drive, uh, get a cab to the to the restaurant, I got in at 1.30, we close at 2.30, and I came there with these two big bags. My dad hadn't talked to me in 10 years. He sees me, he's of course surprised. And he said, should I put your bags in the back, Larry? I said, no, dad, I'm only gonna be here for five or 10 minutes. I wanna tell you something. He said, okay, wait till we close. I sat there for an hour, and I said to myself, Larry, don't tee off on this son of a bitch. Just give him the highlights. Don't, don't just <laughs> wail into him. And so my dad sat down and I wailed into him for almost 20 minutes. You see how I can go. And I talked for 20 minutes about every spanking, every whipping, everything he ever said to me, everything he'd ever done to me that, that pissed me off. And I gave him everything. And I was exhausted. I'd run out of ammo. My dad goes, is that it? You didn't speak to me for 10 years because of that? Wow. And I went, yeah. And my father said, let me tell you about my father. And Ben, for the first time, I saw my father cry. I did not think the man had the ability to summon tears. I didn't think he could do that. <laughs> That's true. I knew my father was an only child. I knew we had no relatives because, on his side because we never got any gifts for, for Christmas. Wow. Aside from that, I knew nothing about my father. I met his mother once when I went to the South, but I knew nothing at all about, about my dad and didn't care. I didn't like him. My brothers didn't like him either. So it wasn't like I was curious about him. Mm. So he said, let me tell you about my father when we're sitting in these two stools in my dad's cafe. He said, your last name, Elder? I said, yeah. He said, that's not the name of my father. I said, what? What is your father's name? He said, I have no idea. You never met your father? No. Who's Elder? He was in my life the longest. My mother had a series of boyfriends, each one more irresponsible than the other one. Elder was a drunk, uh, seldom worked, and when he did, he'd take home the money, give it to my mother so that she would keep it so he wouldn't drink it away, and then come Wednesday or Thursday, he'd want it. If she didn't give it to him, he kicked the crap out of her. If ever I tried to do anything, he kicked the crap out of me. And he, and he was in my life, my dad said, the longest. How long was the longest? He said, four years. I said, what after, after that? Series of boyfriends. I'm now 13 years old, my dad said. I came home from school, eighth grade, and I was making too much noise for my mom's then boyfriend. My mom... And, sided with the boyfriend when he and I were fighting, and she threw me out of the house, age 13, never to return. Athens, Georgia, Jim Crow South, at the beginning of the Great Depression, I defy you to find somebody with a hand dealt like that. Uh, my father goes down the road, Ben, he picks up trash, does anything he can do. Ultimately, he becomes a Pullman porter for the trains. They were the largest wow. private employer of blacks in those days. And so he was able to travel that. all around the country, which was eye-opening for a little black boy from the South. And he came to California one time on a run. And it was sunny, and people seemed to be less racist. He could walk into a restaurant and get served. And my dad said to my mom, maybe someday I'll relocate to L.A. Pearl Harbor, my dad joined the Marines. He was the first black Marines. They were called the Monfort Point Marines. People don't know, the, know about them, but they were every bit as influential as were the Tuskegee Airmen that everybody knows about. Mm -hmm. There were 20,000 Monfort Point Marines from 1942 to 1949, uh, and Congress gave them a Congressional Gold Medal a few, a few uh, years ago.
My dad got his posthumously. Anyway, he um, was stationed in Guam, became a staff sergeant, was charging, in charge of the cooking facilities. He can cook anything. He could look at a cake and tell you what was in it. So he goes to Chattanooga, where he had met and married my mom, uh, and wow. knocks on doors, all these restaurants, to get a job as a cook. And they told him, we don't hire to his face. He goes to an unemployment office. The lady says, you went to the wrong door. He goes to the hall. He sees colored only, goes through that door to the very same lady who sent him out. He came home to my mom and said, this is BS. I'm going to L.A. I'm going to get me a job as a cook, and I'll send for you. Comes out to L.A., walks around for two or three days. I'm sorry, you have no references. And my dad, of course, told them that he was a World War II vet. He cooked for the service. I'm sorry, you have no references. My dad even offered to work for free. Just give me a written reference. They wouldn't even do that. So they treated him the same way in L.A. as they did in Chattanooga. They were just a little more polite about it. He went to an unemployment office, one door, sat there in a chair for a day and a half. Lady calls him up. I have a job. Don't know if you're, if you're going to want it. My dad says, I'm sure I'm going to want it. What is it? And she says, cleaning toilets with a company called Nabisco Brand Bread. My wow. dad did that for 10 years, took a second job cleaning toilets at another bread company called Barbara Ann Bread, uh, cooked for a family in Pacific Palisades on the weekends, and went to night Palisades. school two or three nights a week to get his GED. The man never slept, Ben. An hour here, two hours here, you do that week after week, month after month, year after year, and you come home with a, with a household full of three rambunctious boys and see what kind of mood you're in. The man was tired, and so we talked for eight hours. Wow. I asked him everything I could ask him. He asked me about my life. The man got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and I got smaller and smaller and wow. smaller. By the end of the hour, eight hours, I'm crying. And I said, Dad, I am so sorry. And he said, Larry, you made don't me cry. Just follow the advice I've always given you and your brothers. Hard work wins. You get out of life what you put into it. Larry, you cannot control the outcome, but damn it, you are 100% in control of the effort. Yay. And before you moan and whine about what somebody did to you, go to the nearest mirror, look at it, and say to yourself, what could I have done to change the outcome? And finally, he said this, no matter how good you are, how hard you work, how moral you are, sooner or later, bad things are going to happen to you. How you deal with those bad things will tell your mom and me whether or not we raised a man. So I wrote a book about it called Dear Father, Dear Son. The reason for the title is because after this eight-hour conversation, I fly back to Cleveland. My father wrote, writes me a letter. He never wrote me a letter in his life. And it said, Dear Son. And I wrote him back and I said, Dear Father. I never called him father before. And so then we began this relationship that lasted 35 years and arguably even closer than my mom and I were. My mom and I were very, very close. So I was able to, wow. uh, to salvage my relationship with my father and have 35 really good years. Wow. That's the book so is called good. Dear Father, Dear Son, Two Lives, Eight Hours. And it's on paperback also called um, A Lot Like Me. The reason we changed the title is because people thought it was a collection of letters. <laughs> and the publisher realized that that turned off people. It's really a, it, it's, it's a novel. It reads almost like a novel, but it's a, it's a book of, of memoirs. Well, it's an amazing story. And it does lead to the question, which is, I mean, your, your dad, obviously, an enormously tough individual just from the story. And, and you're a tough guy, too, in the sense that you've taken an enormous number of slings and arrows over the years to take this position. Why do you think it is that so few folks in my, not just the black community, the Hispanic community, a lot of various minority communities tend to not move along those lines, tend to, tend to not suggest that the first indicator of success is individual decision making, but the first thing that we have to overcome is society's institutional racism yeah. or yeah. Uh, m some sort of miasma of discrimination that is preventing people from achieving their goals? It, it's a complicated question, but, but it starts with the family. And I know it sounds counter, counterintuitive because my father had no family. But if you don't have a, a, a family, a role model inside the house, a father inside the house, you're in trouble out, yeah. out of the gate. And 70% of, of black kids today are born to unwed mothers. Um, and uh, the number was 25% in 1965. And what we've done with our welfare state and the so-called war on poverty, which Lyndon Johnson launched, uh, is to incentivize women to marry the government and allow men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. Mm. And the, 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 the black kind of victimhood mentality is a phenomenon of the civil rights movement going from demanding equal rights to demanding equal results. And that's what we have right now. People are demanding equal results. Results have to be earned. Uh, rights come from God. Uh, and so people like Jesse Jackson and the Congressional Black Caucus and the NAACP and this whole cabal of organizations telling black people that they're victims is, is, a, is a huge part of the problem. How do you think that conservatives should go about speaking to black folks, obviously? Because th that's been a serious issue. Every time somebody tries to engage with the black community, uh, there, there are folks on the left who particularly start calling them those people racist, right, and suggesting yeah. that they're pandering. Or, right. or and, that and that's because nobody really wants to tell the truth. Uh, yeah. Cory Booker just the other day said he wanted to have an honest dialogue about race. No, you don't. If you have an on honest dialogue about race, you don't want to hear it. Uh, to me, the most dangerous race hustler in America is not Sharpton. He's bad. 
Not Jackson, he's bad. Not some of the Yahoos you see on cable television, they're all bad. But it's Eric Holder, because people listen to Eric Holder. He's sophisticated. Uh, he's got uh, degrees from, from Columbia, undergraduate uh, and, uh, and law school. Works for a very prestigious law firm. Was a uh, respected to the left uh, AG. He says the most outrageous things um, and gets away with it. For example, uh, he gave a speech in which he talked about pernicious racism. This is around the time that Donald Sterling lost his team. You remember he was taped by his girlfriend and made some disparaging co comments about blacks and ended up losing his team. And Eric Holder said, that kind of blatant racism, that kind of blatant bigotry, we got that. That's not the problem. The problem is the pernicious racism. And he gave three examples, none of which hold up. The first example was the push for voter ID. Polls show that about 80% of whites want voter ID and about 70% of Hispanics do. About the same number of blacks do. Um, and there was a study recently by by uh, researchers from Yale, from uh, Stanford, and from Penn, and they looked at the research paper that purported to show that voter ID suppressed black and brown votes, and they trashed the methodology these re other researchers used and said there's no evidence whatsoever that these voter ID laws suppress black turnout. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, 2008, when Obama got elected, for the first time in history, despite all these alleged voter suppression efforts, the percentage of eligible black voters who voted exceeded the percentage of eligible white voters who voted. So it's nonsense. The second one he gave, oh. Oh, is that black kids are expelled. So on that alone, that, that just crushes the whole idea of saying, well, you know, we have been disenfranchised and we don't, they don't, we don't have IDs to go vote, but he's saying pe black people crushed the polls for Obama. Mm -hmm. So what happened to all these disenfranchised people that couldn't vote? Right. Disproportionately high rates compared to their percentage of that given school. And, um, and it's true, Th they are. Uh, Jesse Jackson, some years ago, sued the Decatur School Board, which was, was, was all white, because they kicked out a bunch of black kids who were fighting after a football game. Turns out the kids had missed collectively like three, four hundred days of school. Anyway, they kicked them out. Yeah. In wow. comes Jesse Jackson, accuses the school board of racism, files a lawsuit. School board defended itself by pointing out that at other school districts where the school boards are primarily people of color, black boys are still disproportionately kicked out. And they mentioned Oakland, which was primarily of school board members of people of color. Uh, 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 San Francisco, also the majority of the school board members were people of color, and yet the black boys were kicked out far more compared to other people when you look at their percentage in that given school. Mm. So it's just a lie, and the lawsuit was thrown out. The third thing that Eric Holder said is that black criminal defendants uh, who commit the same crime will get a longer sentence than white criminal defendants, and that's true. But the U.S. Sentencing Commission says the reason for that is that judges take into consideration on the time of sentencing your criminal history and other factors, for example, whether or not you have a, a working history, whether or not you show remorse, all those factors. So even the U.S. Sentencing Commission, to which Eric Holder referred, said you can't conclude one way or the other whether or not bias is, 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 is operating here. There could be all sorts of factors to explain this. Mm -hmm. So though, that's the best you can do. And this is the front runner guy uh, who's articulating the, the racism in America. Uh, all you could do is come up with voter ID and this expulsion stuff uh, mm -hmm. and the sentencing stuff. He didn't even say uh, they were disproportionately arrested. Didn't even didn't even come there, come near near saying that. So uh, it's a lie. And he said all these things, and people sat there and they politely listened to it, and it seemed respectable, and nobody challenged it except for me. I wrote an article about each one. I wrote one about the expulsion rates. I wrote one about voter ID, and I wrote one about sentencing. Did you know that every like on this video creates one? Wow. wow. Unlearn, relearn. Wow. Such Unlearn, a great relearn. story, though, about him and his dad. That was. Wow. But that's his foundation, what he learned. Yeah. That you got. And then that's why he learned that effort of work. Because his dad worked and he grinded out and he didn't let people um, look down no him and an take answer. no. Yeah, yeah. So that makes sense. Wow, that's dope. I mean, if anybody, if you, nobody should be dependent and focus only on dependency. I believe at, unless you get to a certain age, when you get to a certain ages, it's, 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 it's you can really, it might get a lot more limited. But when you are a younger person and you got breath and you still very active, you need to be getting it like you can. Yeah. Yep. Set it up for yourself. So when you get older. You have some things to be able to fall in place because yep. you're not going to be able to move at the same pace forever. Correct. Yeah, you're going to it's going to start to slow down a little bit. You're absolutely right. Yeah.
But that was awesome. That was and good. That, that's something I didn't know. Unlearn, relearn. Um, like, comment, subscribe. Don't take a nose top. Comment down in the section below if you want some more. Let go. Let go. All Let's right, guys. See you in the next video. Ha. Let's get me. Let's get the thumbnail. Mm -hmm.